Hey all, second morning of the trip. Uh, we're heading off towards the southeast corner. Hello Nathan in the back there. Uh, heading towards the Flint Hills and uh, today's supposed to be pretty warm, a bit windy, uh, hopefully wet later in the evening. So I'm hoping that'll bring out some wildlife. So we'll see what we, f we find today. Yesterday was pretty good. Let's hope today's the same. As you saw, it often takes friends who are just as nutty as me to deal with me over a full four or five day trip. <laughs> anyway, on this day of the trip, we headed southeast to a very interesting part of the country, a region where uh, completely different habitats meet each other. In the northern Flint Hills, uh, you have rolling grasslands, what is actually the only remaining patches of the original tall grass prairie that covered the eastern Great Plains. And as you move south, those tall grass prairies meet a kind of interesting patchwork, uh, almost network of forests, gallery forests that come up from the east and the south, uh, from Oklahoma and also further east in Kansas. And these gallery forests bring with them a number of different species that are not found in the plains. And so down here in the very bottom portion of the Flint Hills, you find species that you don't find anywhere else in uh, this portion of Kansas. You have things like timber rattlesnakes and copperheads that come up through the forest. Uh, western rat snakes that really tend to dominate uh, within some of the forested areas further east. And then a number of plains species that also live right next to them. So a in very interesting just amalgamation of different species. Now the hope is always that you'll find species that you've never seen before and botanists that I am, usually the first things uh, that I will find are plants. Uh, the wildlife will always come later but some of the interesting wildflowers that we found here uh, will grow on the roadsides or in certain areas where there was often heavy grazing where uh, ranchers would bring in their cattle and then keep the land open in that way. You would have uh, some of the plain species that really thrive in those open areas show up here like the uh, prairie celestials that we would find in massive bunches. Uh, in later videos, we'll show you these as well. They will cover entire hillsides in blue, or the flocks and verbena that will grow alongside them. But despite the wind today, much to my surprise, shortly after we stopped focusing on some of the wildflowers, it didn't take long to start finding very interesting wildlife. <laughs> this guy's not. The biggest jumping spider I've ever seen is like an inch and a half long. Look at you, dude. Wow. We've got a uh, Great Plains skink here. Missed one yesterday, so I'm glad we've uh, got one today. He's actually right in the middle of shedding off his old, his old skin, so we've got all the pretty colors showing up underneath. Uh, these guys get a little bigger than this. They can get almost two feet long in some cases although most of it is usually tail. And you can actually see right here, something's got him before and he's actually regrown this part of his tail back. So that's one of their biggest defense mechanisms. And also, <laughs> they're pretty willing to bite. This guy will go after me if I give him half a chance. So we'll get a couple of photos and then we'll put him back under his rock here. Not only was this the first reptile of the day, but this was also the first brand new uh, species for me to catch for the day. And while this is a species that lives in Colorado, it's only found in really kind of the eastern corners and not where I live, so not a species that I get to see at home. Uh, I did exaggerate a little bit on their size. Um, these guys max out at around 30 to 40 centimeters usually, although certainly a few can possibly get a little bit bigger. They are the biggest skink species in their genus, and they are found roughly from Iowa and Missouri south into Mexico, so the southern half of the Great Plains and the coloration that you can see on this guy is actually his coloration, that kind of red speckling. It's not blood, it's just the colors that they develop on their sides. And you'll notice the uh, scales on his back have this kind of crescent shape of black on each scale, on the back half of the scale. Babies, they are actually almost solid black and they have bright blue tails like many skink species do, and they lose that as they grow up. And the males develop some somewhat brighter colors and usually slightly broader heads and bigger bodies to help kind of fight off other males as they compete for females. Now, 
Uh, one of their biggest defenses, as I mentioned, is they can drop their tails. Like other skinks, uh, if a predator goes after them and it grabs their tail, the tail will actually break very easily, and then that piece will stay behind, twitching and wriggling to distract the predator, and then the lizard will be able to get away. Now after we put this guy back under his rock, we discovered some rather interesting other creatures along the side. Uh, this is the middle of a plains area. The nearest water is like a quarter mile away, and yet right on the side of the road, there was a crayfish in a burrow. Now my best guess on the identification of this guy is a prairie crayfish, a species that is often found a long ways from water and uh, usually in the middle of fairly dry environments with deep burrows. But of course, my crayfish identification is worse than it, than it is for turtles or, as we'll find out later, frogs. So if you have a better idea on what this is, please let me know. Here is a herpetologist busy at work, scouring through the foliage for his next prey. He's quite excited, yet odds of exasperation are quite high in these trying times. Sadly, he will go another day without finding any prey. Got a little race runner here, six line race runner. This is the uh, prairie subspecies. Usually these guys are way too fast for me to catch, so flipping them onto rocks is about the only way to find them. And then once again, as was common on this trip, the first couple days, the wind kicked in. But that's all right. Uh, this species is um, fairly common across the plains, and different subspecies are found almost all the way across the U.S. Uh, it's named the Six Line Race Runner for obvious reasons. Uh, those really brilliant white and dark stripes that run down the back, which help actually kind of disguise the outline of the lizard as it's running, kind of confuses the predator, doesn't allow them to really figure out which direction it might be going. And this particular subspecies gets its uh, name Viridus due to the color of the adults, which often can turn brilliant greens and sometimes even blues on their sides. Uh, these guys are insect eaters like most other lizards in North America. And like a lot of other species also, they can also do the autonomous uh, tail dropping, where if a predator attacks them, the tail can break off and then continue to twitch while the lizard gets away, and then that tail will regrow. Now this guy, he had a little bit of dirt in one eye from digging around in, under the rocks, but don't worry about his uh, health too much. He'll wash that off, or it'll come off in the next shed, and he'll be good as new. Now after we found that guy, we uh, put all the rocks back, and make sure when you, whenever you're herping, always put the rocks or whatever other cover you are flipping back exactly as you found it, so you don't disturb the habitat too much. But after we did that, we crossed over to the other side of the road to look around, found this bush which had a bunch of interesting, I believe these are some kind of swallowtail caterpillar, and then almost immediately after, the first really good find of the day. He's least likely to bite, so... All right, you feeling? We've got a double flip here. We've got a speckled king snake youngster and a prairie ringneck snake. You can see the color underneath his tail there. Absolutely brilliant scarlet. That was absolutely perfect. So we'll go do one at You got this is diet Diadophus punctatus omnii, the prairie king or prairie ringneck snake. They don't get a whole lot bigger than that, and they're typically invertebrate eaters. They'll eat slugs, earthworms, things like that. They are mildly rear fang venomous, but they literally can't bite you, so... Unbelievably cannot, like, they can't do anything. And this guy, Lampropeltus uh, jetula holbrookii, the speckled king snake. This is a young one. As they grow up, these uh, bands across their back will kind of fade as all of their scales turn speckled. Each individual scale has a little yellow mark on it. So they turn into a one almost unicolor speckled snake. And these guys will eat other snakes. So I'm kind of impressed that these two were hiding underneath the same rock. Because usually this guy will eat the other one. But I guess it's early in the year. So they're just kind of chilling for now. Can you get the head? <laughs> so we'll get 
get a few photos and then let it go. Yeah, you know it's going to be a good day when your first snakes are a double flip underneath a rock cap. So we'll start with the uh, ringneck snake here again. As I said, Diadophus punctatus arnii. This is the prairie ringneck snake, and this might be one of the more widespread subspecies of the ringneck. Uh, the ringneck, there's only one species in the genus, and it is found across the entire U.S. Uh, from coast to coast. Different subspecies found in different areas, although it's possible some of those subspecies might qualify for being separated into full species, because uh, they range from little tiny ones like Mississippi ringnecks and such that only get maybe a foot long. Same with these guys, they don't get much bigger, to the regal ringnecks that get almost a f uh, two, two and a half feet in length, and they're huge compared to a lot of their relatives. Um, they're named ringnecks for obvious reasons. They have that bright, either yellow or orangish ring around their neck. Uh, exactly how full that ring is can sometimes be a defining trait of certain subspecies, whether it goes completely around the neck or if it's broken by a little black bar right along the uh, spinal cord. These guys are part of the Dipsadid, the uh, Dis Dipsadidae family. Try saying that a few times fast. Uh, this used to be in the Colubridae family, but since a uh, few genetic studies have been done, they've actually separated out into a full separate family. And all the snakes in this family are rear-fanged venomous. Now, some of them can be fairly dangerous to people. You can have some bad reactions, like the false water cobras. Most of them, however, are completely inoffensive to people. Uh, either they cannot bite at all, like these guys, or uh, worm snakes, and so on, or they can, but the venom is not designed for people, so it's meant to stun uh, small fish or frogs or worms or slugs, and so the worst that any person is likely to get is maybe a mild rash for a day or two. So overall, despite being venomous, these guys are still considered harmless to people. They like to live underground, especially the ringnecks. These guys are almost completely fossorial animals. They hunt under rocks in loose soil looking for their favorite prey, and they themselves then are food for other species, such as our other little friend here, the speckled king snake. Now, some people actually do separate all the different subspecies of the common king snake into their own species. I do not because they integrate very fluidly at all of the edges of their ranges. This is one of the central uh, U.S. subspecies, the speckled king. Uh, they are found across uh, most of the uh, Mississippi Delta and Great Plains regions integrating with the Eastern Black King on the, to their east and then with the Desert King to the west. Uh, speckled kings when they're adults have very beautiful uh, almost unicolor patterns uh, with kind of silvery or black backgrounds and either white or yellow spots. Uh, this guy you can see has a lot of yellow in his pattern as of some of them age, some of them will lose that yellow, others actually retain it. Although, to see an adult, you'll have to probably wait until the next video. Hint, hint. Uh, these guys are notorious for being snake eaters, hence the name King Snake. That's actually where it comes from. They like to eat other snakes, so ringnecks, garter snakes, whatever they can catch, including venomous species such as coral snakes and vipers. Uh, a lot of people like to call them good snakes because they will actually take down uh, the venomous species. Although it's important to remember, there is no such thing as a bad snake. Venom is just a means for them to capture their prey. King snakes are entirely non-venomous, and they actually catch and constrict their prey in order to kill uh, it. And they actually have a very, very special, unique way of constricting where they will make perfect rings around whatever they capture and exert a lot of pressure onto the whatever they've caught, and this is thought to be one of the reasons why they are so good at catching and eating snakes. Now, again, this guy is a very young specimen. He was probably born uh, the previous uh, late summer or fall, and over the next few years he will hopefully survive and grow up to be a four, four and a half, possibly even a five foot snake. See if you guys can see him in there. We got a smooth green snake in the bushes here. Come on, focus. I'll bring him out in a second here. All right, you can see him just barely in there. Look at that. Or 
wait. Oh yeah, this is No, this isn't. This is a rough green snake. All right, I believe that's Ophiodrus uh, bernalis. I have to double check when I get back, though I can, I'll put the real uh, name up on the video, of course. These guys are insect eaters, so they actually go for crickets, grasshoppers, other things crawling around in here, so very uncommon type of prey item for a lot of snakes. And this is my first ever one, too. I'll take some pictures if you'd like. Yeah, we'll go take some photos. So now that my fumbling in the videos is out of the way, yes, this is one of the two green snake species that we have here in North America. You have the smooth green snake, Ophiodrus vernalis, which is found to the north and west, uh, particularly running down through the uh, Rocky Mountains, even as far as into Mexico. And then in the southeastern third or so of the U.S., you have the rough green snake, Ophiodrus Aestivus. These guys are a bit longer, a bit s slimmer than their uh, smooth cousins, and they are also quite a bit more arboreal. You tend to find these guys up in bushes, uh, sometimes quite a ways up in trees even, uh, where they will hunt uh, arboreal insects, while the smooth green snakes typically are found more in grasses, under rocks, and so on, and they will hunt uh, grasshoppers and crickets and similar insects like that. And again, this is one of the few groups of snakes that actually does feed on insects. Uh, most snakes will not, and even if you try to offer them insects, they will refuse. This is one of the few snakes that will actually take those insects and feeds almost exclusively on them as well. They particularly love crickets. Now, being an arboreal forest-loving species, uh, these guys uh, come only about as far west as right where we were in Kansas. They do come a little bit further west in central Texas where the forests stretch a little bit further to the west, but otherwise they are fairly restricted to the southeast. And um, within this area, they're fairly widespread, fairly common, but a lot of people don't see them because, of course, they blend in really well with grasses and leaves. As you saw in the video, unless you know exactly what you're looking for, you're probably going to pass right by these guys. Uh, the bright green color is actually created by a uh, couple of different pigments. They have or one pigment and then some uh, interesting structures in their skin. Uh, the blue is created by uh, structures in their skin that actually reflect only blue light. And then they have yellow pigments, xanthins, which mix with that blue reflection to create green color. Now when these snakes pass away, unfortunately like if you find one that's been killed on the road, um, that yellow pigment breaks down very quickly, and so within an hour or two of death, these snakes actually turn from their brilliant green color to blue. And as you can watch here, just as quickly upon release, these guys will vanish into the underbrush. And after this, it was a fair while before our next big find, but we did find a number of other things as we poked around along the sides of the road. Uh, some huge tent caterpillars that were living right near where the uh, rough green snake was. Uh, more huge clumps of that beautiful rose verbena that grows out on these uh, wildlands. And then a uh, funny thing out in Kansas, something that I'm not quite used to at home, is everywhere you go, there are turkey vultures circling. So. I don't know if it's just because they do really well in this particular area or if it's just Colorado is a place where they don't do as well, but they are just everywhere. Now our next stop was in a grassy little uh, area within one of the gallery forests near where a little stream was traveling by, and in this area I was kind of hoping to find some rat snakes, but uh, it wasn't rat snakes we found, but we did find some other herbs. Another coal skink. Said I just missed another coal skink.
frog. Got him. Oh no. Okay, I need some water. Keep him wet. I think this is a great tree frog, actually. Oh no. Okay, I need some water. Keep him wet. I think this is a great tree frog, actually. Can you open that for me? Got ourselves, I think, what is a little gray tree frog here. A bumpy skin. Jumping around in the leaves here. We're gonna try and keep my hands wet so that we don't let him dry out. There we go. We don't want to let him dry out and we don't want to really get anything from our hands onto him either. Uh, one of the couple of species here, I'll have to double check exactly which of the species it is in this area because there's a couple of different uh, small frogs that live in this region, but really cool little find. Now with that ID flub out of the way, this is actually a Blanchard's cricket frog, a uh, fairly common species across much of the Midwest and Southeast. Uh, they are quite closely related to the northern cricket frog, which is found just a little bit further north and west of here, and comes a small ways into my own home state, Colorado, but is not found where I live, so this is also, either one would have been a completely new species for me. Uh, the Blanchard's cricket frogs, they don't get very big, only a couple of inches long, and they are highly variable in coloration. They can be almost completely drab brown like this guy is. They usually have some banding or stripes on their legs, especially on the back of their thighs, or some of them will also develop kind of rusty looking stripes down their backs, or another common variation that you will see uh, later in this series is kind of this beautiful green arrow or stripe that develops right down their back. So that really kind of clay, muddy brown, but with a brilliant leafy green right on top. Now, we released that frog, and then I continued poking around, as you'll see shortly, while Nathan got busy uh, videoing a rather beautiful, uh, one of the blues butterflies that lives around these areas. There are a number of different small blue butterflies. I am not good at identifying their species, but this one was particularly sitting very nicely on a little flower, so we took a chance and got some photos of him. Love it. See if I can't move any of these. There's some interesting uh, mushrooms growing in here. I can't move a lot of these. There we go. How do I look at them? there. You press the little blue playback button. Thank you. Oh, well, can't do anything with that, okay. We got ourselves another oh, little froggy. He is very ready to run away. So actually, I'm pretty sure these are tree frogs because they're not going for the water. So I don't think they're the cricket frogs. Got some cool stripes on the back of the legs. We'll be able to use those for identification. This guy's a little darker than the other one. Uh, we'll let him go in a sec here. So we got a couple more photos of this guy and then uh, continued up the road. Uh, discovered actually that these guys are not restricted to just these really foresty, uh, cool areas within the uh, gallery forest, but instead uh, they're perfectly happy anywhere that it's wet because we found another one that was jumping around right on the side of this really rocky clay area next to a driveway. All right, we got another green snake. Second one younger and even more beautiful. Just take a look at this. 
Oh, beautiful second little green snake. This one. Yeah, it's another rough green. He's got his tongue sticking out. He's checking things out. It's probably a young of the year from last year. He's pretty small. Or he might be two years ago because they don't get too huge. But sitting on the branches out here. He's looking for food along the waterway. And he doesn't have mud covering him, so he's even prettier than the last one. So we'll get a few picks and then let him on his way. And he was a brilliantly green animal too. Probably was a couple of years old, uh, like many other snake species. Uh, this species lays uh, eggs. The eggs are relatively small, kind of elongate, ovular, and kind of a leathery texture like most snake eggs are. They don't have hard eggs like uh, birds do. Uh, and they typically lay them in like small moist hollows. Uh, hollow trees and rotting logs are often really common places where they will deposit their eggs. Then the babies will hatch out in late summer, get a few meals, and then find places to uh, hibernate over the winter. Here, he'll just vanish right into this stuff. you're looking at he would just disappear and up at the top of the hill the wind was definitely blowing hard so you can't hear anything I might have been saying in the video uh, but you can see that this guy is a much smaller snake than the uh, first one that we found much brighter uh, ring around his neck, so this was probably a snake that was born either last year or maybe just the year before. And here another look at his belly showing uh, not only the pattern that kind of defines this particular subspecies in part, but also the uh, coloration that kind of fades from orange to red as it goes down to the tail. That red being the part that they curl up and then turn over to flash at predators in order to startle them so that the snake has a chance to get away. New species, lion snake, Tropidoclonium lineatum. Found right underneath the rock here. Been looking for these for so long. now. These guys are relatives of the garter snakes, but they're in a different genus, and they'll get to about hmm, twice the length of this. But this guy is probably a last year's baby. They give live birth, and they like to eat small things like uh, slugs and earthworms. So hopefully we'll find a couple more out here. Part of the Nutricidae, uh, the Nutricidae family, just like the relatives of the garter snakes, uh, line snakes are uh, very small animals with uh, mildly keeled scales, and they look a lot like garter snakes as well. However, you can tell the difference uh, between them because line snakes tend to be uh, much more stout body animals than garter snakes. They have a more rounded head. And also, if you were to look at the uh, belly patterns, garter snakes usually don't have any sort of pattern on their bellies, while line snakes have a very distinct row of crescent or half moon shaped uh, markings that run straight down the middle of their belly. Now, like their favorite prey, uh, earthworms, these guys are usually most active at night or after heavy rainstorms, and otherwise are often found under various kinds of cover. And though they have a rather spotty distribution across a lot of the Great Plains, they are rather interestingly uh, quite common wherever they tend to be found, and also tend to be quite common in uh, little pockets even within developed areas, such as um, the middle of cities. There are certain areas within and around, say, the Denver metro area where they are known to be actually quite locally common. in here.
The striped bark scorpion is the only scorpion found in Kansas and is found throughout most of the state and even extends a short ways up into Nebraska. After that last uh, stop, we uh, parked for a little bit in a local town to get some food and also charge some batteries because the one in my good camera died and I didn't realize I should have charged it more the night before. But after that, we then crossed over the highway and went headed right south almost to the border of Kansas and Oklahoma and in the late evening hours found our last few animals. Okay, we got ourselves a little ornate box turtle here. Not much different from what we got back home, but... I'll see if we can take a peek at him. We got ourselves a little ornate box turtle here. And it looks like he's been through some hard times because he's got a lot of his old shell busted back here. Might have been from fire or something trying to get at him. This is a little guy here. And once more the wind kicked in. So these guys, this is about as far east as this species comes. Uh, as you move further south and east, they are replaced by other species such as the three-toed box turtle, which we'll see later on. Um, but they're also found fairly commonly back home, so this is a fairly familiar species to me. Uh, they use those really long claws that they have for digging, and this one we think is a male because he had a bit of a concave shape to his plaster in the bottom of his shell, which allows him to kind of fit on top of females. And what I was just pointing out in the video a second ago is the reason why these guys are named box turtles is because they have a sort of hinge in their plaster in the bottom of the shell on both the front and the back of the shell, so they can literally fold it upward and close themselves completely inside so that predators cannot get at them. Alright, so I don't know if you guys can see him or not, but there is a green snake right underneath the car here. We're going to get him out so we can get some photos. There he is. So we've got ourselves a third rough green snake here. This guy was crossing the road and I thought he was a piece of grass, so I almost ran him over. Blocking the sun. But, managed to get him out. He's a, he was under the car. He's all safe now. Long, skinny boy. He's got no dirt on him either, so he's absolutely beautiful. He's probably two, three years old. And great find for the day. A third rough green. And as you look through the pictures here, you can probably tell that the better photographer in the group is not me. But nevertheless, this guy is a beautiful animal. Uh, really exciting to be able to find three of these guys in the same day after not having ever seen them before. And uh, it was getting kind of late in the day, so these guys are just kind of finishing up their moving around because these are very diurnal animals. They move around during the day. They are very sight uh, oriented, they hunt by vision as well as using smell, and they don't do a whole lot after dark. That is the realm of a few other species. It's going. Okay. I'll let him go over in the grass here. Yeah, if I'm good, I'm letting you. Watch your steps. <laughs> yeah, if I step on another snake while putting a snake down, that would be ridiculous. So, get let him go. Okay. You can figure it out. Back to the ground. And there he goes. Gone just like that. Alright, we got ourselves a garter snake. Beautiful red sided. Look at this guy. Oh no. Oh, he has been. I can see blood in his eyes. I'm sorry, dude. But he's still moving. And he's actually doing pretty well, so... It's possible he might actually be able to recover. I don't know. Beautiful. I'm hoping he can, but yeah, he's not doing well. Either way, I'm gonna move him over here. Get him off the road so he doesn't have to worry about cars anymore, at least. That'll give him a chance. Oh my god. We've got ourselves a prairie king. Oh, that is a perfect way to end tonight. Look at you. Lampropeltus caligaster. You are gorgeous. Okay, we'll get another video. Okay, I'll get another video. Oh, look at you. I'm taking a video right now. 
saved your life there, bud. Why? He seems quite still. Did he only get hit? Nope. Well, he's not going to like not you. Venomous, right? Nope, not venomous, but Look he'll definitely try and bite. The belly. Oh, you're okay. You're okay. Look at that. This is perhaps one of the best snakes that we could have found today, honestly. And oh, he does oh, not like you. Awesome. Yeah, this is Lampropeltis caligaster. These guys are very much burrowing fossorial animals. And yeah, biting is about the only way they can defend themselves, so no surprise that he's going to try and bite me. What's but, he got on his back there? Oh, that's musk. Okay, that's Yeah, he's defending himself. Musking and biting, that's about the only things they can do. But these guys are almost always underground. During uh, early spring is about the only time they'll come kind of out onto land. And so, really lucky we Get found this face. guy. Like other king snakes, these guys will eat other snakes as well. And... Uh, often that includes venomous snakes, like uh, rattlesnakes and uh, copperheads. But these guys usually are going after other fossorial species, like the worm snakes, uh, decays brown snakes, things like that. They'll hunt lizards, rodents in their tunnels underground. That is an absolutely perfect end of the day snake if we don't find anything else. Definitely one of the best snakes that we could have finished up with. So this is, uh, again, Lampropeltis caligaster caligaster. This is the prairie king snake. There are two other subspecies currently recognized, uh, two different kinds of mole king snakes found in the kind of the Carolinas and then Florida. Uh, some people split these into separate species. I do not because they still integrate fairly fluidly. Uh, these guys, uh, the prairie king snakes, are found across most of the southern Great Plains, so from Nebraska down into Texas, and then also found eastward uh, through much of the southeast. They grow upwards about five feet long at maximum, and they're often confused with very similar looking uh, rat snakes, like the Great Plains rat snake or the western rat snakes. However, ways you can tell the difference is that these guys have perfectly smooth scales. They don't have keels like rat snakes do, and they also have a much more rounded head. And the Great Plains rat snake, which probably looks the most like these guys, also tends to have an arrowhead pattern on its head, kind of like its relative to the corn snake. These guys are missing that. They rather have a couple of bars that kind of run up along the sides of their heads. And uh, again, these are very secretive fossorial animals, so most people do not see them unless you are actively looking for them. At most, they are usually found undercover, so uh, rocks, logs, sometimes in abandoned structures, but very uncommonly out in the open crawling around, unless early spring when they are starting to get out, get their first basking going, looking for mates, which this guy might have been doing. And also, one thing to note, uh, you may have noticed in the video, this guy was frequently kind of bobbing his head up and down. That is kind of their warning, the saying that, yes, I am willing to bite you if you come closer. That's their threat to try and get predators to leave them alone. There you go. Ready? Yep. All right, so we're going to take him up here. Hi, dude. Okay. Here. Here. We'll be safe in there. Go on. Good boy. What's the deal? Here you go. Oh, I need to be further away. Awesome. All right, so today went quite a bit better than I was actually expecting it to. So, got a lot of good animals, and hopefully the next couple of days will be the same. Uh, if we do find some more stuff, then you'll probably see it in the next video coming up. If not, then wherever else we end up will be the next one. Uh, I'd like to thank all of my patrons for helping make trips like this possible. Uh, Jana Lee, Sandy Casey, Denise Carlton, and Nathan Hyde, who's out on the trip here with us, also helping out doing some of the uh, filming and photography. And if you guys would like to help support as well, um, consider joining at our Patreon account, www.patreon.com slash hcarlton. Uh, you can help support there. Uh, you get some exclusive benefits back. Uh, if you can't do that, uh, you can always check out the actual website, carltoncarnivores.com. Find uh, plants and resin jewelry for sale. There's also a link to the Teespring shop that's on there. Uh, and if you guys can't uh, help with monetary means, then always remember to like and subscribe. 
on the videos here because the more attention the videos get the uh, wide more widespread that it will be uh, displayed to other people so they can learn and uh, the closer we get to me being able to actually support myself off the videos themselves and then if you'd like to see more pictures and videos and so on, you can always find me on the social media accounts, Facebook and Instagram and even TikTok at Carlton Garnivores. But until you know, either tomorrow or wherever our next adventure lands, this is Hawk and Carlton at Carlton Carnivores.